Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrea, and I work on the marketing team here at The Strand. We're very happy to have you all with us tonight. Um, if you're just joining, keep coming in, invite some friends. We're going to be streaming live on Facebook, too, um, so there's lots of places to watch. Before we launch into our discussion with Heather Cabot, we um, wanted to share a little bit of history, or I want to share a little bit of history with you about The Strand, in case you don't know much about us yet. Um, the Strand was founded in New York City in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. It stretched from Union Square to Astor Place, and Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, the Strand is the sole surviving bookstore. It's now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We wanna thank you all for your support. Please know without our loyal community of book lovers, especially during a pandemic, pandemic um, we wouldn't be where we are today. So thank you so much for your support. Um, tonight, we are discussing Heather's new book, The New Chardonnay. Heather Cabot is an award-winning journalist and serves on the alumni board of Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. A former ABC News correspondent and anchor and former digital lifestyle editor at Yahoo, Cabot has appeared on Good Morning America, Today, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and dozens of local TV and radio stations. She is a contributor to Forbes and is the co-author of the acclaimed book, Geek Girl Rising. Tonight, Heather will be joined by Zibby Owens, who is a writer, thought leader, media personality, and host of the award-winning literary podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Zibby has recommended books at, for the Washington Post, Good Morning America, and Real Simple, and has appeared on Good Morning America, Good Day LA, Good Day DC, Good Day Dallas, and New York One. She has written for Marie Claire, Red Book, and the New York Times Online, and many other publications. She runs Zibby's Virtual Book Club and hosts formerly live, but now virtual salon events. Zibby currently has two book, a two book deal in, for children's books with Flamingo, a new imprint from Penguin Random House. A graduate of Yale University and Harvard Business School, Zibby currently lives in New York in the New York area with her husband and four children. She can be found online at Zibby Owens. Without further ado, please help me welcome Heather Cabot and Zibby Owens. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Zibby. I was like accidentally sharing my screen. I was like, no, no, I hit the wrong thing. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, Heather. How are you? Hi. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you, too. Thanks for uh, doing this with me, inviting me to celebrate oh. the launch with you. I'm so excited to be a part of it. Thank you. This is really an honor for me because I love your podcast and I'm a huge fan. So this is very exciting for me. I even... Uh, I brought, I put on some of my um, special the new Chardonnay <laughs> CBD lip balm. Um, I have to say, I've been like a no, no, no CBD anything for me. I don't know, whatever. But this one, I'm like all in, all in on the lip balm. It's got some good moisturizer in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Heather, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions so you can let everybody know more about your book, if that's okay. Um, Perfect. So. What inspired you to write the new Chardonnay? What made you want to research the whole entrepreneurial life behind the cannabis industry, basically? Well, there are a couple of inspirations. So one, and I know there are a lot of people watching tonight who've known me since I was a kid. Um, you know, I grew up in the Just Say No generation. I grew up in the 80s um, and I, you know, I was never part or really had anything to do with the marijuana subculture at all. I mean, that the, uh, you know, growing up during that time, it just really wasn't part of my, my life. And now I'm a suburban mom of teens and I'm looking around and I'm seeing celebrities who were talking about, you know, uh, marijuana, like as if it's just, you know, normal. And um, Oprah Magazine featuring a tea party, a THC infused tea party with women wearing white gloves and hats. And Martha Stewart is on TV with Snoop Dogg and this pot humored cooking show. And I'm looking around and I, I just, I was really surprised by it. And so the other aha moment is that um, my first book, Geek Girl Rising, a part of that book was focused on women investing in women-led tech startups. And so I was involved in that world. 
And right around the time that that book came out in 2017, I noticed that some of the female angel investors and venture capitalists that I had met during the course of reporting that book, that some of those women were investing in cannabis startups. And I thought, my goodness, like these are people with Wall Street credentials and they seem so straight laced. And I, I thought, why would they invest in anything that's federally illegal? I just, I couldn't believe it. So I started making phone calls and I started to learn about how this industry was just exploding. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of it. And um, really what sealed it for me was I, I somebody who I'd interviewed um, had said, who, who's an investor had said to me, look, I can't explain this to you in just a phone call. If you really wanna understand what's happening, you have to go to the marijuana business convention in Las Vegas this fall <laughs> and you can imagine what my family thought when i when i said i'm going to go to the marijuana business convention they were like what are you doing and but honestly going there and seeing um that it was just like you know like the consumer electronics trade show it was like any other trade show that i had ever been you know that i'd ever covered as a journalist i just couldn't believe that it was um at the scale that it was and how professional it was and the people that i met were so serious about it and um and I just realized that there was a whole story there that many people didn't really know about. And so that, you know, that just made me feel like, well, I've got to, I've got to pursue this. It's so true. I mean, this is really an amazing business book. I mean, this is up there with like, you know, James Stewart's like Disney war and like all these, no, it's true. Cause it's, a real, it's an examination of an industry and what happens and what makes an entrepreneur and how, unpredictable characters become stars and it's it's so much more this could have been about any industry but it's it could have been about the internet if this was like 20 years ago but instead you found this new industry which of course has so much more associated with it than just a product so i don't know it was like fantastic reporting Thank probably you. all your years as, as a reporter but <laughs> um, well some of it was having the time you know i i i came out of local news i came out of you know i had several years in network news but even you know, I, it was rare to actually have the time to work on a story in depth and to be able to, you know, chip away at something over years. I mean, that is just an incredible luxury. So um, I'm, I'm so happy that you, you say that, you know, you could really tell the, the depth there because, because it's not many people get to do that. And that really is a privilege. And the way you were able to write it in such a narrative way, like, Beth Stavola is laying on her table and you know now she, here she is at the pool in Arizona thinking like, what did I get myself into? And it's like you're, you're drawn into the narrative of it. You almost forget that somebody had to go report it. You know, it's like when you see a war photograph, uh, photograph and you're like, okay, well that's just a boy like on the street. But then you're like, well, somebody must have been on that street to capture that reaction. And I feel like that's the immediacy sort of this one. Um, tell me more about how you got all your research done. Aside from the one convention, like how many trips did you take? How many interviews did you do? Like what was the process like? Um, so hundreds of interviews. And part of that is because first of all, just getting my arms around this industry was, I mean, the learning curve was, I can't even tell you how steep it was because this is a topic. I mean, not only is it, it's complicated, it's controversial, but it touches on everything from business to politics, to science, to medicine, um, social justice. I mean, it's it's so rich, but, and, and there's so many different facets of it that are really nuanced. And so um, I, beginning, it was really just working the phones and talking with people and um, kind of figuring out what were the, what were the various threads of the story I might want to follow. Um, but it was a it was a lot of just talking to people um, and then traveling to meet them in person. And um, so my family, I, I cannot thank my family enough. My husband, I mean, the book is dedicated to my husband because he did so much heavy lifting when I was traveling because, you know, since adult use is not legal in New York, um, a lot of my a lot of the folks that I needed to follow were out in California and Colorado and Canada and all these other places. And so I would have to go away for um, I try I usually tried to keep it to like two or three days. If I was going to the West Coast, I'd try to just cram in a ton of, of interviews and and my family on the West Coast, my two sisters, um, you know, they were like and my parents when I was in Arizona, you know, everybody let me crash with them. And that was always nice because I was able to, you know, fit in some family time too. But um, I mean, it was really a team effort because to cover this kind of a story where it's just 
happening in so many different parts of the country. It's such a fragmented industry, right? Every state is different. So to really understand that, you have to you have to go to these places and meet those people and um, talk to people there on the ground. So it was a, it was a total adventure. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun, and I'm so thankful that I had the chance again that the time to just you know learn and talk to people so I could absorb it all. And, I st and I'm still learning. And by the way, I'll just say the industry changes so quickly. I mean, that was the other that was the other challenge with this story. It was like covering a news story. So, you know, certain uh, characters in the book where I thought something was going to go a certain way for them, I thought, you know, I was going to go with, you know, one character to do something. Well, then that deal fell through, and then, you know, I mean, just. So many things were happening in real time that when I finally sat down to write the book, I, I really had to <laughs> calm myself down because I kept worrying that I was missing something because, you know, it's a book and you do have to stop writing at some point. And I think that was like the hardest thing. And how long, like, what was the actual writing process like after you did all the interviews? Oh my gosh. The writing process was... I want. I was thinking about it today because I knew you were going to ask that. I think I started in May. I don't want to be predictable. This is pressing. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, I I I, I want to say it probably took me in total about nine months to write it to, to to fully write it. It was what happened was it was actually it was due in September and I wasn't done yet and we had we had moved and and so I kept getting extensions and then I turned it in in January. But um, the whole process altogether was over three years because it took me a year. It took me a year to do enough reporting to actually put together a, a book proposal that I thought was solid enough that could really explain that there was a story here. Because there, there have been other books written about the cannabis industry. And I wanted to tell this news story with these great characters. And I really wanted to do a narrative. So I needed time to find, to, to find those people and find those stories. I have to say, I went and and Googled all the people because I was like, "What do they look like?" You created really great, <laughs> but I wanted. To, I was like, "All right, Chef Jeff, what does he have on the menu?" You know, he has. A <laughs> and I was like, "Ooh, my next party." I don't know if we ever have party. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to Kate Houston, Kate um, Kate Houston, Kate Hud Kate H Hudson. Sorry, did you go to Kate Hudson's birthday party when you reported that, or did no. you just? That. No, actually, you know, what was what was funny was I hadn't actually met Jeff yet. I had so the way I met Jeff is kind of the way this will sort of give you a window into kind of how I did the reporting. So I met Jeff because I was reporting on um, Snoop and Ted's uh, venture capital firm, Casa Verde Capital, which for those of you, when you read the book, you're going to find out about how Snoop and his business partner, Ted Chung, decided that they were going to create this venture capital firm. Um, not to invest in like growing or, or you know or even selling marijuana. They actually were investing in the software and all of the, the tech behind the industry, which was it, 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 they had incredible foresight. And so um, I was meeting the partners now that, um, and I had been interviewing the partners that actually manage those investments. And I was telling one of them, this really nice guy um, named Yodi Meyer, and I was saying to him, I, I'm really interested in these cannabis restaurants. And it was at the time that West Hollywood um, was, was I think they had just awarded licenses, the very first licenses for these, you know, weed cafes essentially. And they were gonna be really the first ones in the country where you could actually, you know, dine in public and have, um, you know, uh, some type of, you know, whether it was a vape or whatever paired with your food. And I just thought that was really fascinating. And so I said, do you know anybody who's do in this space, do you know anyone? And he said, well, actually, I just made, I just invested in one of these startup uh, restaurants and I want to introduce you to the partners. So I met the, you know, we met the partners and uh, I started talking a little bit more and then they started telling me about Jeff. And I was like, and then I found out he had a cookbook and I, I got the cookbook and um, there's so many recipes in the cookbook that were like Jewish recipes, like for Jewish holidays. And I just, I was like, that is so funny. And so I just really want to meet him. And so the Kate Hudson thing actually happened. I think, the, I think her party was probably like two weeks before this time that I actually flew out to California to go to a private party that he was catering. 
Um, so I could be with him. I wanted to be with him in the kitchen because I wanted to understand all of his methods. Because again, like I'm a complete voyeur. I don't know anything about any of this. You know, this is like I, I wanted to learn from him and see his methods. And um, so that had just happened. And actually, it was top secret, and no one really knew about it. And then I guess they gave the you know the her people gave the story to E, and you know it was out there, and so he could talk about it. But no, I didn't go to the party, but you know, she posted all of her Instagram about it and it was written about. So I was able to kind of glean some of the details. And then I, you know, I obviously I interviewed Jeff too. So um, yeah, it was it was fun to see him right after that happened too. But he's cooked for a lot of people that, you know, he doesn't even he can't say who they are, but I, he's been cooking for celebrities for a while. Wow. I love his uh his pots ball, like all these yeah. corny, like funny pot Jewish yeah. combos. I mean, who knew? I mean <laughs> yeah. and I loved his mom and his mom Sylvia was so lovely and you know gave me so many great stories about him as a kid. And I mean that was my favorite part was learning the backstory of all these people. Because what I really was trying to do was I wanted to write a book that would appeal to anyone just as a really great story. And the fact that cannabis is the backdrop is just kind of the way it is. I, I was trying to find people that just were going through, you know, their, their stories just anybody could relate to. They were just in a very human, universal way. They were characters that, you know, whether it's as an entrepreneur, whether it's as a parent or, you know, a, a mom who, you know, um, is going back to work after leaving, you know, her, her profession for a few years. So they all had different reasons for why they wanted to get into the business. And I, I that really resonated with me. And I, I tried to really bring that out. So interviewing Jeff's mom, for example, spending time with Beth's mom and her family, that was like such a great experience. And I, I'm so thankful that they allowed me to into their worlds because it helped a lot. I mean, Ted Chung became one of the characters, the main characters in your book, and you track him sort of throughout his teenage years to being an Asian American, but the way you describe him is sort of like too laid back to fit in to the stereotypes there and how, um, you know, he eventually went to this like very waspy school and had to fit in with the blue bloods that he wasn't familiar with and then becomes like, you know, and uh, this complete like maven in, in this industry and yeah. ends up hanging out with Snoop Dogg. And how can you not tell a story about a, a trajectory like that in someone's life? <laughs> I mean, it's well, really- Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about Ted that I, I always found so fascinating about him is he really is a kind of a soft-spoken kind of stoic guy. And, but then once you get him talking, um, he, he really, you know, reveals a lot about himself and about, you know, he, he was very, um, I just loved hearing about his family, his dad, um, you know, what kind of sparked this entrepreneurial zeal in him. And also the, what I also was struck by was how that experience of going to college and, and really sort of feeling like he was on the outside, how that completely shaped the rest of his life. And, his desire, you know, the marketing agency that he founded, Cashmere, which is all about marketing to multicultural um, markets. And the reason why he did that is because, you know, he could he could see that himself. You know, he 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 was felt marginalized, you know, and it was just so smart. And I feel like he brought all of that to cannabis as well. You know, and he um, he just he, he's one of those people that you know people will say he's a visionary and it was just to to talk with him about the the um the insights that he had about where cannabis was going to go i mean and and then to see that he was actually really right on it, that was that was really fascinating um for me just to, to see that and to be able to tell that story because i think in a lot of ways this book is about marketing it's it's about rebranding it. it. It is a business book. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that cannabis is the new Chardonnay. I'm I'm saying it it might be, and these are some of the people that are trying to make it so. So maybe it should be called the new Chardonnay? Question mark. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Uh, maybe for the paperback. Um, tell me about what it was like also talking to couples like Mel and Cindy McDonald who had to deal with 
really traumatic stuff. Like their son, Ben, who was in a horrible car accident and having all these seizures and wouldn't eat. And the power of marijuana to change his health and to save his life, essentially. Like, did that sway you in one way or another in your own personal views of the use of marijuana or the legalization or any of it? Or how did it make you feel? It just, for me, you know, I, this was never an advocacy book. I mean, I always approached it as a, as a voyeur, as a journalist. My, my feeling going in and, and, you know, as I finished it was that I just, I wanted to shed some light on this industry and how it had matured so quickly so that people could make their own decisions about it. I thought it was really important to pull the curtain back on the amount of money and that's involved in it the injustice of, of, of it in terms of, you know, the communities of color that have been cut out of this industry and, and uh, being able to profit from it. Um, and also when you talk about Mel McDonald, the strange bedfellows, like the people you would never expect. And, you know, to be not only involved in it, but like evangelizing. And I, you know, um, I thought, you know, I kind of stumbled into Mel's story because of Beth. And I don't want to give too too much away about the book, but you know, the, they're both uh, their stories sort of um, converge in Arizona and in the early days of Arizona's medical market. And I really felt when I had the chance to actually get to know Mel and Cindy that their story, in so many ways, crystallizes why we've seen cannabis go mainstream. Because um, you know, I I think it's just it's just this idea that um, for so many people. Um, it really is medicine. And I never knew anybody who used it as medicine. I, I just, it was really not even in, um, it was nothing I ever was exposed to. So to meet them, these, you know, de devout Mormons, and he's a formal, former federal prosecutor, as you'll find out in the book, a Reagan appointed federal prosecutor, um, who, who ends up, you know, having this um, aha moment uh, at a time that, you um, you know, he never expected it. And I just felt like along the way, as I was meeting people and reporting the book, there were so many people like Mel, like people you would never expect would get behind this. I mean, when I was working on the book, actually, right before I finished the proposal, that was when former Speaker of the House, John Boehner, who was a, an incredibly vocal foe of marijuana. I mean, he had once said he was unalterably opposed to marijuana legalization. Well, he joined the board of one of the largest um, multi-state operators in the U.S. And I just thought, I mean, that was like head turning. I just, I couldn't believe it. And so there were all these things that were happening like that. So that's, I was so happy that I had a chance to meet Mel and Cindy because I think they put a face on this idea of change and people changing attitudes and why they're changing attitudes. And what about this whole other group of people who aren't using it? that way but the chardonnay moms who you talk about who are happy that they don't have to spend the time even drinking it doesn't go to their waistline like this is the new new thing and they're all like sort of tittering about it you know what about what about them you think this is going to be adopted by like you know mom's night out well i think we're already seeing that in certainly in the marketing to moms i think you know if you go to california you know you go to any place where it's legal for adult use you'll see these products that are labeled as microdose. So it's this idea of, you know, this kind of like, yeah, it's like having a glass of wine. It's not going to leave you hungover. It's not, that's, that's how it's marketed. And I think that there's an appetite for that among a, a certain group of, of people um, that, you know, they don't want a headache. They don't want to uh, gain weight, you know? So I think these businesses are very savvy focusing on that. And what I also write about in the book is that alcohol consumption has has gone down in recent years. And so um, there was an opportunity there for these companies. And I think, you know, it's it's as this as this spreads across the country, as you see, um, you know, more states uh, approving recreational use, I think you're going to see more product innovation around that. And then the other part of it is the, is the growth of CBD which um you know when when which cbd is 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 it comes from the cannabis plant um but there is a uh you know because of the, the farm bill um when it comes from hemp which is a very low thc um a variety of cannabis um that's legal and so that opened up a whole door for all of these companies that have been doing more thc products to consider 
doing CBD lines. And I mean, that's why you're seeing it now in Sephora and Bed Bath and Beyond and all these, you know, your local drugstore. I mean, you can buy it anywhere now. Um, and it's only really been since 20, the end of 2018. Um, there's not a tremendous amount of regulation around it, which I think is problematic. And I think you're going to see guidelines coming out of Washington. But my point is that because CBD is not intoxicating, it is more appealing to people. And there are potential therapeutic benefits that people talk about um, that certainly needs more research. But, but women are using it in large numbers right now for insomnia, stress, anxiety. Um, there was just a, a big report that came out of a, a company called BDSA in Denver that um, tracks uh, sales. And women are driving this. Women are going and, and they're, they're shopping for CBD for all of these, these kinds of things that, I don't know about you, but I mean, <laughs> all my friends, we're all dealing with sleeplessness and stress and anxiety. So you can kind of understand why there's an appetite for it, but also why these companies are seizing on that because they know there's an opportunity there. So I think like, this is, we're just at the beginning. We're like sitting ducks. These We stressed out moms here yeah. who are <laughs> at the tail end of like months of this COVID stuff. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, it's hard. see our market opportunity. Um, Wow, it's amazing. Um, so now that you've finished the writing and now that this book is like coming out into the world, is this like a case closed situation for you? Or is it the kind of thing where you have like Google alerts and you're just fascinated and want to find out everything more that's coming? Like, did this like whet your appetite or 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 clo or shut it down? Um, I... I'm kind of ready for something new. I mean, it was great. I've enjoyed it. And I probably will continue to speak and write about it through the election. And, you know, obviously through, I mean, it, it is a fascinating topic. I am really, you know, I, I really care a lot about the social justice piece and I will follow that closely. And I will probably continue to do some freelance writing around that piece of it. You know, the, the gender equality, gender equity and racial um, and, and social um, equity pieces of all of this. I, you know, I think those issues are, really complicated. And I think that as you see more states um, looking at legalization, that that's something to pay attention to. It's something I care about. So it's definitely from that perspective, but I, am I going to be a cannabis beat reporter? Um, no. So, <laughs> but, um, it's not because, I mean, I, I, I love, this was a, this was a, a very, um, it was an intellectual challenge. You know, it was, it was a really meaty, really amazing topic that I knew nothing about that I had three years to learn about. And I met some amazing people and incredible entrepreneurs, you know, who risked it all. I mean, you know, the book is really about, it's about that. It's about like what drives somebody to go for it when they could lose everything, you know, and I, I'm fascinated by those stories. So I think whatever I do next is going to be around entrepreneurship again, um, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily going to be in cannabis. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm announcing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a, an industry you have your, your mind set on? I mean, I have so, so many, but right now I'm just kind of focused on this because I want to get through the election too. Cause there is, you know, I was saying earlier about how the story is like always changing. I mean, even to do any of these interviews, I have to constantly prepare and stay on top of what's happening. And because the, the for the political scene and I mean just it's it just um, and the business aspect it really is changing every day so I still read my diet of you know all the newsletters and you know I my inbox is full of these like you know marijuana business um, updates for now um, but because that's because I really feel like I need to stay on top of it and I need to be able to speak intelligently about it um, but um, I don't know I it's funny like this i never would have if you would ask me would i ever write a book about this i i mean i would have just I, my family and my friends couldn't believe it when i told them that this is what i was going to write about um and now that now they've seen the book and they know why i that i why i found it so interesting so i don't know yet but i figure out how i have time if we're, we're going to be uh in lockdown for a few more months i'll have time to think about it so i know you have 
teen twins and I have teen twins, newly teen. Um, what do you, what's the takeaway for them? Like as a parent, now that you've learned so much more about marijuana and CBD and like all of it. And I know it was a byproduct of the business side or the passion for the people and the players in the industry. Mm -hmm. But along the way, I know you've learned so much and included a lot in it. What advice do you feel like, like what advice as a mom are you going to give your kids? Like knowing what you know? Well, I mean, what I tell them is what I tell them about alcohol, you know, which is that this is not for you. Um, but we've had some really great conversations about just substance use in general, substance abuse. Um, and, you know, many people, you know, there's sort of a folklore that, you know, uh, you can't become, you know, a habitual user of marijuana. That is not true. Um, you know, people who, uh, you know, have a, a predisposition to substance abuse or they have it in their families. I mean, they can be at, at, at risk. Um, and, and also, you know, it's a new industry and it's not, you know, the, the illicit market is still thriving. So if you live in a place where, I mean, even if you live in a place where it is legal, I mean, and you need to talk to your kids about the dangers of getting it, you know, and, and you don't know, you don't know what's in it. And, and that's for adults too, frankly. I mean, it really is. And it's, um, so I, we had some really great conversations about that. We talked about brain development and why, um, substance use, you know, before your brain is finished developing, particularly THC is, and alcohol, not a good idea, you know, just not a good idea. But, you know, even more than that, um, my most important conversations with them really related to this book were really around the racial injustices of the drug war and really being able to, especially this summer as our country is going through this incredible reckoning on race, um, to have a conversation with them about my work and the relationship to systemic racism and what I found out about how drug enforcement in this country, you know, has led to really, you know, devastating consequences for communities of color. And um, that was really meaningful for me to be able to have that conversation with them as well. And I, I said to people, you know, that my, my kids were actually really embarrassed that I was working on this book originally. And they, they wouldn't, they were like, don't tell anyone what you're working on. I mean, they really were not happy about it initially. Um, but once we started having some conversations about what I was finding out, the people that I, um, that I met along the way, whose lives were touched by the war on drugs and you know, had relatives that were incarcerated or, you know, um, you know, who had experienced um, stop and frisk and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, it was really, it was just really meaningful to be able to give them practical examples of how, you know, we need to, we need to, you know, stand up for injustice and we need to be aware, uh, you know, of what's going on outside our little bubble. Um, and, uh, that, that to me was probably one of the most important conversations that I had with them beyond, beyond the just say no conversation, which thank goodness we've been having for a number of years anyway. You know, it's, it's not just one conversation, right? You know, it's also modeling good behavior. It's, it's an ongoing conversation and you hope, you hope, right. That, that dialogue continues. So I hope it does. It's probably the best thing you could have done. Like, I feel like oh, as a kid, you. if your mom, mom, no, if like, if your mom is into something, then it can't be off limits. Like I, when I grew up, my mom smoked. And then when my friends started smoking, I was like, well, that's not cool. Like my mom does that. <laughs> I mean, like, maybe this is like the, the most strategic way to, uh, to handle it. Really. I, I think they, they, you know, it's like, I knew too much about it. You know, I think it was, I think, you know, but they're so young right now anyway, they're only going to be, you know, freshmen in high school. But the only other thing I'll say for the parents listening, one thing that I I didn't understand and if there's one thing as a parent that you will take away from my book other than just you know sort of like you know just the fun stories but I didn't know anything about um, concentrates I didn't know anything about cannabis oil I didn't know anything about these other products and that is something that as a parent you definitely want to familiarize yourself with um so i go into more depth in the book about it but basically there are derivatives of the cannabis plant that can be made into oils and that's what are that's the stuff that's used in vape cartridges and it's it can be you know turned into a kind of a wax that um kids can there's a thing called dabbing where we're not kids but people 
um, you know, uh, inhale it. Um, there's also, you know, that's used for um, edibles as well. And it can be highly, highly potent. And there was a report that came out of Colorado last week, which for the most part since legalization has not seen an uptick in overall um, teens using cannabis. But this report last week actually found an increase in dabbing and also in vaping, even after the vaping crisis. So what that says to me as a parent, like you just need to familiarize yourself with what's going on and the different ways, the different forms that this can be used. And, and those forms can be incredibly potent. Um, it just, you know, certainly smoking it as well, but but these are highly concentrated forms of THC. So I just think as a parent, it's just, if you don't know about that, it is something to research and be aware of because those forms are can also be much um, more subtle. You, you don't necessarily know that your child ha has that. So I think that's really important um, just to be aware that the products evolve, they're all evolving quickly. And by the way, Jeff on his website teaches you how to make your own cannabis oil. So if you ever want to uh, start experimenting, you could start there. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're an adult. If you're an adult. If you're not an advocate. And you not, live in a state where it's allowed. <laughs> I'm not advocating. It's just putting <laughs> out there. I, I'm not putting out a point of view. Um, uh, well, I know there's going to be a lot of questions. There will be a lot of questions. Um, should we open it up to that? Sure. You... Okay. So if there's already, right. and for people listening, there's this little box at the bottom. It says, ask a question. So you can add it in there, or you can just put something on the chat on the right hand side. I'm pointing. I don't know if you can even tell what I'm pointing to, but you know. Um, okay. Well, this was kind of answered, but it says, how long did you spend researching and writing the book? So about a little more than, than three years, but okay. writing about nine months. Okay, so now I need some more questions to come in or else I'll just hear, wait, it still says one. Um, nope, same one. Okay, well, people, um, as they come in, can, uh, but in the meantime, people are telling you, you have great insight and energy. They can't wait to read your book. Oh, right. Presentation, Heather, excellent Yay. interview. So, woohoo. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I mean, w were there any surprises in the book for you in terms of like the characters or were there, without giving anything away, but was there, was there anything in there that you didn't expect? I mean, most people, you know, they see the cover, they don't necessarily know that it's a narrative also. Yeah, to be honest, I was surprised by how, um, how story-like it was and that it was less, it wasn't a book about why this should replace Chardonnay at all. Not that I thought that's necessarily what it was, um, but it was just so much more like one of those reported business books. I just kept thinking that over and over. Like, um, you know, it seemed like, you know, I was sort of analyzing the marketing of it. Like, it seems like you're trying to market the book mostly to women, or I don't know if that's true or not, but. Yeah, um, no, that is, that is, that is true. Right? Like, that with is the true. script and like, I don't know, the wine glass and this makes me wonder. Yeah glass of wine I don't know um and you're like adorable care package which was so sweet and amazing um but I was thinking like this is something that like my dad who like inhales business books and like this type of thing like this seems more like bad blood or like you know some of those types of stories that are like well, um, suspenseful and not maybe business is the wrong word but do you know what yeah, I'm trying to that, say no, I mean, when I was telling people what the concept was, I said I wanted to write the money ball of marijuana. That That is actually yeah. what I said. Oh, and yeah. the, first title, the first title for the book was The Wizards of Weed. That was actually what it was going to be. And it, it, it was, it, it, and through the course of, you know, kind of massaging and figuring it out, you know, in the end, it, it, felt, it felt right to try to market it more to women. Although I do think that, you know, I think men would find it fascinating too. I think I think because it's because it is a business book and it is it talks about popular culture and it talks about you know, it's there's there's lots of aspects of, of the book that I think people will find it. anybody who's interested in entrepreneurship I think will, will find it, it interesting. But I, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'd love to explain a little bit about why it's called the new Chardonnay. So yes, it's called the new Chardonnay because when I met Ted and Snoop, when I met Ted the first time. He talked about Chardonnay moms. He actually said to me that he felt that the future of the, of the, the modern marijuana consumer was going to be the Chardonnay moms. It was going to be the soccer moms. It was going to be 
you know, the women we know, you know, who have a glass of wine at the end of a, a long day. And I just, I just thought that was so, it was not what I expected at all. Um, so that was one part of it. Then as I delved into it even more, and I, I, there's a part in the book where I talk about this company that was one of the first companies to start gathering actual, like using sophisticated algorithms to, to gather customer data. They started realizing that actually there, there were moms, there were women and parents and seniors who, who were actually buying this and, and actually were like the fastest growing markets. So there was that. Then there's the fact that Colorado, which I did not know until I started, you know, even though I actually was a reporter in Colorado, but I was there after this happened. But, but many people who don't live in Colorado don't know that the ballot initiative there to legalize recreational marijuana was actually written the act to regulate marijuana like alcohol. And there's a whole um, chapter in the book about how they were trying to, how the activists trying to get this passed were trying to make this argument to the people in Colorado that cannabis was safer than, than alcohol. And that, that was their argument. And I didn't know that. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and then the final piece was, well, those two more pieces was Bruce Linton pursuing this idea of the cannabis beverage of the future. So I felt, well, that was, and he was also going after the Chardonnay moms. And then the last thing is Chef Jeff. And his microdosing and his mic, his layering of THC, you know, throughout the meal, so that you would feel like you had a glass of wine. So there were all these things to me that felt like, again, it's sort of this idea of rebranding this as a glass of Chardonnay, and that's really where the that's really where the title came from. Um, it just seemed from all those different points, from all those different people. They're just it just kept coming back to this analogy of alcohol and wine. And I just I just thought that was I don't know. I just thought it would speak to people. Totally. No, I, I mean, I love the title. Um, I remember like in one of the last parties before this whole thing happened, I was pouring my friend Nancy a glass of Chardonnay. I was like, oh, would you like some Chardonnay? That's what I was drinking. And, you know, she was at my house and she was like, no, 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 like Chardonnay. <laughs> Chardonnay is for fat people. I only drink the tequila. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, I'm drinking, I'm drinking Chardonnay. So anyway, maybe some people think tequila is the new Chardonnay, but I guess there's, I guess it's all up for debate at this point. Well, no, actually it was funny because some people said to me, well, you know, Chardonnay is kind of passe. And so maybe you want to call it something else. And I was like, no, but the thing is Chardonnay to me you know, it, it kind of, re it represents the mainstream. I mean, everybody knows Chardonnay and it, wa it was, you know, it, it did have this heyday. And actually recently I was writing about this and I and I was researching like how Chardonnay became popular in, in the US and yeah, the grapes actually originated in France and they, they, they came to the US, they really weren't starting to be planted in mass until like the early seventies. And that's really when it started to take off. And in the 80s, it became like this sensation. But what's interesting is that's 40 years after prohibition ended. That was 40 years after alcohol prohibition ended that Chardonnay became this big sensation. So if you think about that, if you compare that to cannabis, I mean, cannabis prohibition is we're only in terms of like recreational use, we're only, you know, not even 10 years into it. And it's not even that's not even across the country. So it's, we don't know what the products will be in the future. I don't know, what, you know, I don't know what of cannabis of this time might be akin to the new Chardonnay. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what these companies come up with. Well, we have a lot of questions. And by the way, I didn't, okay. mean, I didn't mean to suggest that I don't like the title because now there are all these comments oh. depending the title. I was just talking about the marketing. That's all. Okay. <laughs> anyway, lots of questions here. What was the most surprising thing you found while reporting the book? Well, I was talking about it earlier. I didn't know that there were all these other ways that I didn't know about these derivatives. I didn't, I, I, when I thought of um, cannabis, I was thinking, you know, flour. I, I was thinking of, you know, somebody smoking a joint. I, I like, you know, again, this was not my world. So I didn't, I had no idea that there were things like breath strips and or like, or suppositories. I mean, I had no, no idea that any of this stuff existed. And so 
that was really interesting to see like the breadth of, 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 um, of products. I also didn't know anything about, I, like most of you, you know, I had only really heard of THC. I really didn't understand what CBD was. And actually most of America, you know, like more than half Americans don't even know the difference between THC and CBD. But what I also didn't know is that those are only two of hundreds of these compounds that are in the plant. And we don't even know what all of them actually do yet. And they're just starting the research on that. And that's why from a, a medical point of view, it actually is really interesting that there are a lot of, um, there, uh, there's so many parts of this plant that um, we haven't even really discovered yet. And so that's kind of interesting to me. And I think in the future, you're gonna start to see this too, especially now as people are starting to make this distinction between THC and CBD. I think you're gonna start to see other cannabinoids start to be marketed um, as as people, you know, as more research is done on on what they do, and you know, there may be products that are very specific to certain cannabinoids that, um, you know, you'll you'll you know you'll buy a product that will be high in a certain one for a specific specific, specific use, you know, like you'll something for sleep or something for stress or something for, you know, um, it's it's kind of limitless. But I think that's really interesting. And the other thing I didn't know either was I didn't know about this thing called the endocannabinoid system, which is our bodies actually have, in, in our bodies, we actually have the co compounds that mirror the same ones that are in the plant. And they don't really know exactly how all of them really work together yet. But that is one reason why when you hear about some of the therapeutic aspects, that's why. And, but again, we're so early in the research. So I think that's really, you know, a, there's a lot that's going to be uncovered in the years ahead. So I think I'll, I didn't know any of that before. Someone says, talk about the money. How much do these products cost? How much is being invested and how much is being made? Well, I'll give you some just uh, statistics that have come out. Like right now um, in 2020, it's estimated to be a $15 billion industry in the, the US uh, by the end of 2020. And that's even with the pandemic. Um, by 2023, there are some estimates that it'll be up to a $37 billion industry, and that would be more than craft beer. Um, it, 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 it is, it is major. Um, the, these are very expensive businesses to run. So the ones in particular, when I'm speaking of, I'm talking about businesses that quote, touch the plant. So businesses that are focused on cultivation or manufacturing like these derivative products I was talking about or retail, just applying for those licenses. And I talk about this in the book. I mean, it can be a million dollars just to apply, just to, just to get through the application process. And then in many places you have to have the real estate, you have to have already secured where your business is going to reside before you know you have the license. So you're going through the pro you have people helping you write, you know, the application, you're hiring lobbyists, you know, you're doing all of that. Then you're also paying for real estate. That's before you've ever even opened the door. Then you get the license. Then you have to do everything to comply with whatever state um, regulations there are around security. I mean, there's just so, there's so many things. So it, it is a, a um, it is a big business, um, but it also takes incredibly deep pockets to play. Um, because it's still federally illegal. So, um, you know, there are no small business loans um, and it is largely a business that's conducted in cash. Uh, so that also means you have to have incredible, you know, security. Um, there are a lot of risks to, uh, you know, employees are dealing with large volumes of cash. Um, that's another thing, you know, for people who are interested in this topic, you know, to watch what's happening in Washington, there's some, um, you know, been a, some movement on banking reform related to cannabis, which would open up um, banking and financial services to these companies. It's, it's, it's stalled right now, but, um, you know, everybody's sort of hoping that that will, you know, come November, that that will move again and um, would make things a lot easier, not only for these businesses, but also allow um, entrepreneurs who've not been able to get capital to be able to start businesses and, and you know for people who don't have a network where they could just you know ask friends to invest in their you know in their in their cannabis business you know where it's, they're looking for millions of dollars and then most people don't have that so to be able to um, access loans is going to hopefully open it up to many more people who feel like they've been cut out 
Okay, here's one. Did any Snoop Dogg lyrics resonate with you while writing the book? Well, there are some in the book. I, actually, you said, the um, book. you said, uh, got my mind on the money, my money and the money on my mind. Or yeah, anyway. yeah. That, that one really encapsulated <laughs> that moment at the end of that, at the end of that chapter. Um, yeah, that was, I would say that was pretty much, that, that, that was like a theme of the book. Um, definitely, <laughs> you know, got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Or, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, and also, you know, I mean, that we all know Snoop's like iconic lyrics, like, you know, smoke weed every day. I mean, you know, that's like certainly in the back of your mind. But, you know, again, what was interesting is that like he he is one type of person who we imagine, like he and he like he sort of typifies like sort of the old cannabis in some in some senses, right? And I'm talking in this book about sort of this whole new audience that isn't interested in getting high necessarily. You know, they're interested in all of these other um, effects that, you know, they, they don't they don't want to be uh, stoned out of their mind. That's that's not appealing to them. So it's just, it's interesting. And I always found that fascinating that his team sort of they got that, you know, that that that's not necessarily who the new consumer is. Um, and um, and I write about that in the book about, you know, sort of their design team for their products and how they thought about the products that, that uh, you know, Snoop's brands, um, how they package them in a way that they thought would appeal to more of the kind of curious as opposed to sort of the old world stoners that we might, you know, have an image of in our minds. Kind of curious. I like that. Good. Yeah. good word. <laughs> Is this wave um, of the glamorization of pot a uniquely American trend? Someone wants to know, or C Canada, or Europe, or Asia? Question mark. Well, Canada has very, very strict rules. Extremely strict rules on advertising. I was just actually talking to somebody about this earlier this week. Um, that you know, the the Health Canada, the the. Um, health department there that oversees the, uh, the the program in Canada has very, very stringent rules. Um, and in fact, when the medical program in Canada first started, um, you, you could only get it by by mail. You, you, you had to actually uh, call and place your order. Or you could do it online and you could only order it by mail. Um, it was even now, uh, from what I'm hearing from people, the, what, the last time I was there, um, the dispensaries were not open in Ontario yet, which has been a problem there because you can't buy it in person now that you're allowed to buy it in person. But somebody was telling me that earlier this week that the dispensaries are very clinical still. It feels very pharmaceutical. Um, and I did go to some events there. The week, the week that Canada legalized across the nation, I was up there for an event. Um, and they were originally, I was originally invited was that, okay, this is sort of a funny story. I did this didn't get into the book, but I went up to do this. It was a it was a event around cannabis and sex. It was a, it was a, basically a sex and cannabis workshop, and it was at this Victorian mansion in Toronto, and they had all these like sex therapists there, and it was like this it was for women, and it was just like this whole idea of like empowering you know your sexuality, and blah blah blah. And so I, I was invited by this brand that uh, has a presence in Canada and I get to the event and they're like, well, we're really not allowed to talk about cannabis, but like that was, that was why I was there. And <laughs> as Health Canada, like with, within, I guess, like a day or two of the event said to them, no, you can't promote this, you know, as a cannabis event. And so they had to kind of quickly, you know, anyway, it was just sort of interesting. So yeah, I, in Canada, that, that's really where I'm, I'm the place I'm most familiar with. And, um, you know, just given my, my, my research. And I mean, there are celebrities who, I mean, Snoop, you know, has a, a licensing deal with Canopy Growth, but even those products, um, the label, the packaging is very different from here and they, they are not allowed to advertise. Okay, this question is, what is Martha Stewart doing in the weed business? Well, I think Martha would say she's technically not in the weed business because um, her relationship is with Canopy Growth and it is as an advisor on their CBD products, which are which come from hemp, which are legal uh, here in the US. Um, uh, you know, um, in, on the, if you've ever watched the, sh the, the cooking show, um, you know, she kind of, it's sort of a wink, wink, but she, you know, she doesn't really, I mean, Snoop is sort of talking about, you know, what he's consuming and all the jokes are around consumption, but she's, she's really focusing more on the, on the cooking. I think she's done a pretty good job of, of, you know, kind of, um, 
she's she's found a, a very uh, artful way to sort of get involved in the industry, but really kind of drawing a line between the intoxicating side, which is still federally illegal, and and CBD, which is more focused on the wellness um, market. Why do you think marijuana use is still, this is what we're talking about, but is still federally mm -hmm. legal, especially learning about all the medical uses? It's a really, really good question. Um, I think it's very, it's very complicated. I think, um, I, you know, I, th I think, you know, there, there are, there are lots of different reasons. I mean, some people might even say, you know, there are even, there are tax implications, you know, these, businesses that are legal in these states, there's something called 280E in the tax code. This is going to sound super wonky, but but the, the point is that these companies are not allowed to write off most of their business expenses. So they are paying major taxes to the federal government. Um, and so that is, you can't, really, you can't discount that. Um, well, I think what's interesting is that if you look at the polling on marijuana legalization, you know, from even from the time, you know, um, like Gallup first started, um, you know, surveying people about this, it has never been higher. Acceptance of legalization has never been higher in this country. It's more than two thirds of American Americans are OK with it. Um, but yet the federal government is still kind of dragging its heels on it. Um, and we'll see what happens with this, you know, if there's a new administration and, uh, you know, what it, it, another thing is what's interesting to watch is, you know, um, Kamala Harris has been very open in recent years. She's changed her tune, but she's been open and has written about, uh, you know, the fact that she is pro-legalization. Joe Biden um, hasn't gone that far yet. So I think a lot of people in the industry and in sort of the activism world, they're kind of watching to see what's going to happen there. Um, I don't think there'll be any resolution until after November, but, and also I think we have to see what happens with, with the Senate as well, because the House has passed a number, you know, they, they passed this banking act I was just talking about, but it's been stuck, it's stalled in the Senate. So there's a, there'll be a lot of interesting things in, in, I think in the year ahead, and you know, Arizona, New Jersey, I mean, more states are taking up, um, uh, recreational use. So it's just continuing to spread across the country. Um, okay. Last question. Cause most of the other ones are, are repeats. Um, okay. how are you dealing with people that are having a hard time having this amazing, honest conversation about the industry? Have you had a hard time with others in your community with this being a polarizing issue? I think, no, not really. I mean, I think, um, I really haven't had a problem with it at all because people know once they ask me about it they know that i'm not taking a position on it and i you know my job is to just present the information and to come at it with fresh eyes and to try to present it in in an interesting way um i mean i want people to read the book but uh you know i want people to make their own decisions so i you know people it's it is interesting when people uh, heard that I was, you know, people I'd meet at the dog park or whatever, they strike up a conversation and say, oh, what are you writing about? And, and they would ask me like, well, how do you feel about it? And I think, you know, and I would just say, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not taking a position on it. Um, I mean, the one thing that I, I, I have, and I've said in this conversation, the, the one thing that I think it is important that we as a country really need to acknowledge, you know, um, we, we, I think we need to acknowledge the harms of, of the war on drugs on communities of color. And we need, we need to, we do need to deal with that. We need to, you know, make sure that in states where uh, they do decide to legalize that part of that program includes clearing people's records. I mean, it's ridiculous that there are states where this is legal, people are making millions of dollars. And there are people whose records still have low level marijuana convictions and they can't get jobs. They can't, you know, get housing. They can't, that, I mean, that's just not fair. So I think there, there's, you know, certain things like that, that I can say that I didn't know anything about that at all going in and then learning about it, it, it feels very unjust. But, um, you know, I think people have to make up their own minds about this. And I think it's a very nuanced and complicated topic and there are societal implications. So I want people to understand the big money and the, the muscle behind it. And then, you know, they can make their own decision about, you know, how they, how they feel about it. Excellent. 
Well, Heather, thank you. And thank you to The Strand and congratulations on your book. Thank you. Chardonnay. Amazing. Um, thank you for including me in the launch and thank you to oh everybody my gosh. who listened <laughs> and asked questions and everything else. And please go buy the book for anybody who hasn't yet. There's a little link at the bottom right there, purchase the new Chardonnay. So. Sibby, thank you so much. This is like a dream come true. I've been listening to you for months and to be able to be interviewed by you was just really, it was like the icing on the cake. So, I mean, I just, I'm, thank you so, so much for your time and for all you do to support authors and to encourage people to read. It's just, it's so important. So thank you. And thank you to The Strand also for this opportunity. It was just, it made the launch week for me, honestly. Yay. <laughs> Thank and thanks you. everybody for joining us <laughs> too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.